one imagines you're as left as confused by that introduction as I was. And I feel really awful that this is the conversation I wanted to have with you. I realise this has been an extraordinary day of activity and I want to spend the next seven minutes talking about boredom <laughs> and why it is that we all should be deeply, deeply bored, at least periodically. Um, I realise I also should probably finish that introduction. I am indeed a cultural anthropologist. I do indeed work at Intel. The answer to what a cultural anthropologist came to be doing at Intel involves a man in a bar in Palo Alto in 1998. <laughs> Which is like all good Australian stories, it involves alcohol and reckless decision making. <laughs> and I will tell you that when I'm off stage and off camera if you'd like any more details. It also means you should never ask me to coach your children about their career decisions. <laughs> because the answer turns out to be spend more time hanging out in bars. But what I wanted to do today was make a plea for boredom and I wanted to tell you a little bit about why. I shot this photograph in an airport in Beijing about uh, a month and a half ago and I was really struck as I was sitting there looking at the fact that everyone around me had a mobile device in their hands. Every single person and every single person was doing something. And I thought to myself, we're sitting at this incredible crossroad if you want to take the metaphor for today. This extraordinary moment where the internet is bringing this promise of constant connectivity of endless devices that are smarter in some ways than we are, are the promise that there will never be nothing to do again, that there'll never be a moment of downtime, a moment of boredom. And I thought to myself, is that a good thing? And then I thought to myself as an anthropologist, as someone who spends a lot of my time in people's homes talking to people about their everyday lives, about what they care about, about what's important to them, that one of the things I had heard over and over again recently was that people felt deeply overwhelmed. And I wondered if there was a relationship between these two things, about the loss of boredom and the sense that we're overwhelmed. And so what I wanted to do was think about what it might be to bring boredom back. And I thought, well then, to do that you actually need to know something about the word boredom itself. And I discovered something extraordinary about the word boredom. If you read the Oxford, you know, Oxford English Dictionary, which might be an act of boredom in and of itself, <laughs> you will discover that boredom did not come into the English language until 1852. Charles Dickens, in the book Bleak House, parenthetically deep irony here, Dickens in the book Bleak House coined the term boredom. And actually, you know, at that point boredom comes into the language. It had kind of flirted around the English language through Oscar Wilde and the use of the word ennui, which for those of you who speak French, you know, is not quite like boredom. It's a little more interesting and slightly more classy. <laughs> it's true. So boredom arrives 1852. If my pal Rupert is out there somewhere, I know you think Disraeli brought it in earlier, but he didn't. 1852, boredom. Boredom is intimately at that point linked to the notion of choice. Before boredom, we didn't have choice because there was no leisure time. We were just working and then you could be idle. But with boredom comes the notion of choice or perhaps with choice comes the notion of boredom. Lots of theories about boredom. Uh, psychologists would argue that this is a probably a bad state. Sociologists think this is how we end up getting ourselves in trouble and juvenile delinquency springs from the root of boredom. For many of the philosophers in this collection, they argue that boredom is actually a fundamental state of being and something that we might want to spend more time attending to. Heidegger, a man who it turns out philosophised on boredom a great deal, again possibly ironically, uh, suggested <laughs> that boredom was a fundamental state of being and that we should spend our time waking boredom up, not putting it to sleep. And there's some interesting data to suggest why that might be the case. Uh, if you MRI people's heads when they're in a state of boredom, if you can get them to be bored while you're doing that. <laughs> It is a methodological research problem here of how you study boredom. I suspect it's like studying sex. It's something we lie about all the time. <laughs> but if you study people's brain patterns when they are allegedly bored, their brains are actually lit up like Christmas trees. So there's an incredible amount of generative potential of boredom. So I thought to myself, where would we go looking for boredom if we were to look for it? Well, you know, train platforms and airports. I know this is a very long quote. This comes from Heidegger, and Heidegger talks about finding boredom on a train platform. And I won't read this passage out loud to you, but were you to read it, it should immediately sound familiar to you. This is the boredom of many of our childhoods. This is the boredom of sitting around with nothing much to do and nothing and no activity seems good enough. I was talking to Patrick, who I know is out there somewhere out back uh, earlier at lunchtime, and I said to him, you know, boredom is clearly from my generation, but I'm old enough to be Patrick's mother, which is a frightening prospect indeed for both Patrick and I, I suspect. Um, <laughs> But realising that you know, when I was in my teenage years, that's now quite some time ago, and I was thinking, well, maybe boredom is one of those things that went away. And Patrick assures me that when he was a young man, i.e. 10 years ago, and he would go to his mother and say, I'm bored, and his mother would say, well, mow the lawn then. 
he would reply, I'm not that bored. <laughs> and so without the risk of being nostalgic, I think there's something interesting here about the boredom of our childhoods and about the notion of there not being something to do. And then I realised that part of the reason that's gone away is we always have things to do now. We can keep busy on train platforms. There are four billion cell phones in the world. There are two billion computer connections and millions and millions and millions of televisions and other devices. So we're no longer bored on train platforms. Turns out if my colleague Tony Salvador is still in the room, 10 years ago, he's, well, 15 years ago now, he studied teenagers and discovered that when they were bored, they were bored, but as soon as they got driver's licenses, they like to be bored together rather than bored alone. <laughs> I think I can make an argument we still like to be bored together and that would explain our propensity for all sorts of social activities where we bring our mobile devices with us and play with them rather than talk to the people that we're actually with. And certainly our work on Facebook and studying social networking suggests that when people are bored they say, well I was bored so I went on to Facebook. What that says about your social relationships is deeply problematic and interesting. This device ensemble belongs to a colleague of mine, might be familiar to those of you, even if you're not an Apple fanboy, I'm willing to bet you have lots of devices in your life. Turns out having lots of devices in your life also means you have to spend a lot of time looking after them. They're very needy. They need to be plugged in, they need to be connected, they need to be given power and passwords and all manner of things. And I increasingly have to wonder to myself whether a billion downloads from the App Store is actually a metric of how bored we are, not how engaged we are. We also know we have to be constantly connected. I'm sure for many of you in this room, one of the first things you do when you get up in the morning is check some form of digitally intermediated communication. Some of you are nodding, the rest of you are lying. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, your email account, I don't really care, I'm willing to bet all of you are doing that. And we do that because we live in a world where it's possible, but it turns out even if you're someone without a broadband connection and a 3G connection, the notion of being constantly connected isn't that far away. This is Mia and Atu who are in um, Mali. They are constantly connected to everything and they talk about what it means to be constantly connected and the tension here between devices that work better when they're connected and human beings who work better when they're intermittently disconnected. So what it would mean to think about world systems where we are in fact not connected and where there is a privileging of time spent not online, hugely important to think about. But it's really difficult to think about what it means to be disconnected and there are some small hopeful signs on the horizon. Uh, this is from a church in South Korea and loosely translates to say it would be a blessing if you turn off your cell phone. <laughs> it goes on to state on a different sign that in fact there's a cell side dampener so your cell phone won't work anyway. But at least the notion here is starting to carve out spaces, if not for boredom, certainly for downtime. So the question I wanted to leave us with and the question I wanted to kind of suggest to all of us thinking here in the room is one about what we do, not when we're here. This is clearly an event that's meant to be stimulating and engaging, and it clearly has been. But the question is more about what would it take to do, as Heidegger suggested nearly 100 years ago, to wake boredom up. All of us have a plethora of devices in our world, many of which are probably constantly connected in your pockets right now, some of you twitching because you aren't connected to them. But what would it mean not to be? What would it mean to wake boredom up? What would it mean not to be surfing the dial or surfing the internet or downloading another app so that we have something to do when we sit on a train platform or in an airport or arguably in the backyards of our houses when summer finally gets here? You know, what would it mean to not be constantly managing away boredom? What would it mean instead to actually be willing to embrace being bored? Because my suspicion is if you look across cultural practice, you look across human biology, if you look across world systems for the last, oh, I'd say 100,000 years, there is something about being bored that is extraordinarily rich. I know that seems paradoxical and counterintuitive, but there's something about what it means not to be doing something that propels us to make things up, that propels us to be creative and inventive, and that actually propels us forward into being engaged again. So I guess my challenge to all of us in the room is to think about what is it going to mean to be bored? What will it take to leave this place, spend a day digesting it, because I think there's at least a day's worth of things to digest, but then commit to being bored? Not for an entire day, maybe not even for an afternoon, but at least for 10 minutes and just to see where it gets us. So the crossroads I'm thinking we're standing at is the crossroads about how we choose to spend our time and how we choose to spend just very small fractions of it. And my request to all of you is go out and get bored. <laughs>